built to test the limits of automotive design. Without the regulations, we could build a racing car that would race at speeds of 300 miles an hour. A chariot of fire for those who dream of victory. It would be very difficult to get a racing driver to drive a car that was extremely safe, but really rather slow. A star-spangled world where teams spend millions to gain those precious tenths of a second that divide failure from success. A perpetual quest to build the ultimate. If you're serious about motor racing, this is what you drive. The 2004 Formula One car. With its driver, it weighs around 600 kilos. It can go from 0 to 100 in under four seconds and reach a top speed of over 200 miles per hour. It's the world's ultimate racing car. But how did such an awesome and beautiful machine evolve? How did we get here? The first Grand Prix was held at Le Mans in 1906. From the earliest days of the automobile, men wanted to race. By the 1950s, Maserati and Ferrari were building cars with four and a half liter engines positioned in front of the driver. Races were won and lost on one thing, engine power. But in a backstreet garage in Surbiton, England, engineer John Cooper was building racing cars with engines that were smaller and positioned behind the driver. It all started in the 1940s when my father and his best friend Eric Brandon decided to build uh, a racing car. Um, and with crash bits that they found uh, lying around in the garage, um, they came up with the whole idea and the concept of the little Cooper 500. You can see the engine here is a, is a Norton 500cc engine and is directly linked through its gearbox with a chain drive direct to the rear axle. And this was really the beginning of the rear engine revolution. And what you saw then in the Cooper was the engine positioned behind the driver and you optimised the balance. So the car didn't have a huge engine, but it went faster because it had greater levels of grip around the corners. By the end of the 1961 season, every Formula One team had positioned its engine behind the driver. In 1965, the mighty Ford Motor Company approached two young British engineers, Keith Duckworth and Mike Costin, who'd recently formed a company called Cosworth. Ford offered Cosworth £100,000 to design and build a totally new racing engine. The result was the double four valve, or DFV. This is the first time that an engine has been specifically designed for Formula One, but it was also very light because it simply formed part of the car. It bolted onto the back of the car. But position alone wasn't enough to make the DFV a race winner. It also needed power. And the DFV produced a lot more power than any other racing engine. And all that came about because of um, just rigorous attention to the detail of every little bit of the engine. Right. Working with a small team of engineers, Keith Duckworth and Mike Costin went right back to first principles, looking at the physics and chemistry of every single aspect of the engine to work out the ideal mix of components. And the result was an engine which, which revolutionized the whole sport. Today's Formula One engine is deliberately built to last the length of a race weekend and no further. You'd be lucky to get from London to Edinburgh before it needs a rebuild. If they survive much longer, then we've done something wrong because some of the parts are too heavy. So the ideal Formula One engine would blow up as it crossed the finish line in first place. But if a single component gives up too early, it spells disaster. At Jordan Racing, this engine has just come back from the test track. It's performed well and it looks okay, but is there hidden damage? To find out, engine and gearbox will be stripped down. Every gearbox component will be tested using a test called magnetic particle inspection. To the naked eye, this gearbox ratio looks fine. 
but when a special ink is poured over it and a magnetic field applied, it's a different story. UV light reveals how the magnetic field has drawn the ink into a minute flaw in the metal. That flaw could have led to gearbox failure and forced Jordan out of a Grand Prix. A modern Formula One engine produces phenomenal performance. The 40-valve 3-litre V10 kicks out close to 900 horsepower and runs at a staggering 18,000 revolutions per minute. Ever greater engine power. A crucial component in the quest to build the ultimate racing machine. But higher speeds mean faster cornering. As the 1960s advanced, designers had to find new ways to keep the car on the track. For inspiration, they started to look at how planes fly. These are probably the most significant cars I've designed in my career. John Barnard, a legend in Formula One design. If you analyze a Formula One car today, the engine is probably 50% of the performance of the car. If we leave the driver aside, because the driver does make a difference, I mean, you still need your Michael Schumacher if you're going to be world champion. But I think aerodynamics is probably 40% of the remaining 50%. By the mid-60s, improvements in tyre design were allowing cars to corner faster. To keep the car on the track, engineers had the idea to harness airflow over the car to produce what became known as downforce. Downforce is really a, a, a way of maximising tyre performance, using wings upside down. So with an aeroplane, you take off, if you turn the wing upside down, the quicker you go, it pushes the car onto the road. For a time in the late 60s, cars sprouted elevated wings. But they were flimsy structures. After serious accidents in 1969, they were banned. Deprived of their high wings, designers turned again to aerospace technology to improve the aerodynamics of their cars. Since they discovered the wind tunnel, they've never looked back. At Lola Racing's half-scale wind tunnel in Huntingdon, Chris Saunders is carrying out a test on a half-scale model of an American champ car. The car is suspended on a strap which is mounted on, in simple terms, a set of upside-down bathroom scales. That's the easiest way to describe it. These scales on the tunnel's ceiling apply forces down through the strap to the model and read changes in its weight and balance as it's subjected to the equivalent of 145 miles an hour. The data is passed to the tunnel's computer for analysis. It looks like the car will probably take a bit more front. Chris orders the angle of the small upper flap at the front of the car to be adjusted by just two degrees. He then orders the test to be run again. That's about what we would expect as there's been a movement to the front of the car. The centre pressure has moved forward now 38 degrees for two degrees of uh, extra front flap. The computer calculates that the small adjustment to the flap on the model will add more than 10 kilos of extra downforce to the front end of the real car. The wind tunnel data will make the front end of the car firmer and easier to steer into corners at high speed, which will give the driver greater confidence. But it was in an early, far more primitive tunnel that engineers made the most significant aerodynamic discovery in the history of the racing car. A discovery that changed the face of Formula One forever. In 1970, Colin Chapman of Lotus launched the wedge-shaped Lotus 72. Aerodynamically ahead of anything else around, it won 20 Grand Prix and three World Constructors' Championships. Then, in 1976, using a wind tunnel, Lotus designer Peter Wright discovered underbody aerodynamics, a uniquely powerful way to generate downforce. He called the discovery ground effect. Ground effect is a, is a simple theory. Uh, it, it works on the Venturi principle, um, which is that air flowing through a restriction has to speed up, and when it speeds up, the pressure drops. 
1978, Lotus won the World Championship with its ground effect car. The secret of its success was sculpted wings hidden beneath the car. A vital part was these sliding skirts, which actually ran along in contact with the track and moved up and down um, along with the bumps in the track and effectively divided the high pressure area outside of the car from the low pressure area underneath. Um, and that created a terrific amount of downforce. With the competition struggling to work out the dark secret of the 79's success, Lotus went on to win race after race. But Formula One's governing body was growing fearful that ground effect cars were simply too fast and too dangerous. The cornering effect that could have been generated by ground effect was enormous. It's no joke to say that drivers would have been needing G-suits. In 1982, ground effect cars were banned from Formula One. But a new generation of aerodynamicists has found other ways to generate downforce. When ground effect cars were banned, there was a sudden loss of downforce. Um, at the time, I suppose most engineers didn't think we would ever get it back, but we've got it back and we've increased the levels of downforce to levels unimaginable back in those days. They've done it by paying attention to every fine detail in wind tunnel testing. There's various aspects of this car, each of them